Good afternoon, everyone. Familiarity breeds contempt. We've all heard the saying, and we know it to be true in many contexts. When we have easy access to someone or something, we tend to perhaps not value it as much. But as diversity consultants, we work across industries and organisations, and what we're seeing is exactly the opposite. What we see is familiarity breeds understanding and trust and acceptance and collaboration. And in fact, it is lack of familiarity that breeds content, fear, misunderstanding, and ultimately rejection. So how does this play out in organizations? Well, our brains are hardwired to reject what we don't understand, what is not familiar to us, what is unknown, and to be attracted to what is like. Okay, what we understand, what is familiar, what we recognize. And as our organizations become more and more diverse, we are confronted with working with people who are not like us at all. And this presents a challenge to us. The rate of change is phenomenal. And you know, many clients we speak to say, you know, this seems to have happened while we weren't looking. We were busy with this and then the change happened. And that's what it feels like to most, or, most people in most organizations. And what we were talking about this morning, you know, while we can celebrate the fact that Auckland is a very diverse city, we must remember that we got here more by default than by design. We didn't set up 20 years ago to be the most super diverse city in the world. It happened as a result of our migration and as, as a result of um, people coming in from offshore to work in New Zealand. And so, yes, it's a really good thing, but we absolutely can't stop there. Because if we stop there, we really haven't achieved anything much. There's a wealth of research. We've listened to the numbers. We've listened to the research around why it's good for business, why potentially we all need to do this. And while research and best practice and case studies are really useful, this afternoon I'd like to share with you just a few of the learnings that we've gained from working with clients in this space. And hopefully you'll be able to take some of these learnings back to your own organisations and uh, hopefully it'll give you some food for thought. So, lesson number one. Culture is much more than ethnicity. And I know that we in this room know that and we've been talking about it all day. But when we go into organisations, the word culture is used synonymously with ethnicity. And the problem with that is that it's too narrow a definition. It doesn't give us the full picture. Because culture is about everything that makes up that individual. And it is more often influenced by the things that you can't see in the person. Like their faith. And their upbringing. And the social context in which they've been brought up. These are things you can't see. The thing that you can see, or you think you can see, is ethnicity. So we tend to hang on to that. But in fact, people are influenced by much more than that. And if you take this paradigm as, a, as an organizational leader, that culture is much more than ethnicity, then your strategy around counting how many people in your organization have a particular ethnicity really doesn't carry much weight. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to understand what your demographic makeup looks like in your organization, because it's a very good starting point to understand whether your employment base reflects the community you operate in and the customers you serve. But you absolutely cannot stop there. Because the danger of stopping there is that you make sweeping assumptions about what those particular groups want or need or desire. And of course, it's a flawed version of what culture is. So, following this paradigm that culture is about much more than ethnicity, we've done many focus groups across, across different organizations, and there's some really uh, key gems that we've learned, and I thought I'd just share those. Number one, people with a soft voice, or who are soft-spoken, are just as likely to be ambitious as people in your organization who are loud and extrovert. Leadership has a broader meaning to your people than just the context that they have at work. For many people in your organizations, they are already leaders in their community and in the area they live in and in their society. 
And often, within organisations, we fail to see that potential. So we will have the view that this person doesn't have the right cultural fit in our organisation to be a leader, and we won't even recognise that this person is already a leader. For many people, being valued for their contribution is much more important to them than understanding their cultural background. And being heard is more important to them than understanding their accent or speaking their language. Another key learning as well is that two people can look the same, sound the same, even come from the same place, but have vastly different cultural paradigms. And there are many people in the room who will resonate with that. So that, you know, death by assumptions is really, really dangerous. We think we know, but we don't. So, lesson number two. Building cultural intelligence in your organisation, then, is no more than just the collective efforts of individual employees who build trust and understanding and collaboration and can work with people who are different to them. You know, the 20th century organisation where sameness was valued and groupthink was just about the gold standard, fitting in was everything. That's been transformed into the 21st century organisation where value is dif that difference is valued. People who stand out from the crowd are the people who are in hot demand. Groupthink is definitely not the vogue anymore. It doesn't matter what business leaders say, it matters what they do. So absolutely crucial to have your positioning statements and your statements of intent and your policies and your frameworks and all of that sort of thing. But if you stop there, it means nothing. <coughs> Your employees are really interested in the behaviours that you as a business leader exhibit. And as we've seen, it's about building trust, and it's about authenticity, and it's about vulnerability. And this is a very scary place for many, many business leaders. I always look at the, the leadership structures in most organisations, and we've you know, heard from Lewis, and we've heard from other organisations, that you know, diversity is starting to sort of seep up into the organisation, but at that um, leadership level, it's still pretty stagnant. Well, there's a lot of fear around that change, and that's perfectly understandable. But it's that very level that has to start mobilizing for change if there's going to be any follow through or any sustainability in the organization around cultural change. So the burden of responsibility really rests on those leaders to take the first step. Lesson number three because he was deemed to be not a good cultural fit for the organisation. Now, this is what happened. They went out to market for the salesperson, had a whole lot of CVs come in, set up a panel, and did the interviews. This particular individual stood head and shoulders above the rest. There was only one teensy, teensy little problem, and that was that this individual had been in jail for six years for committing a fairly serious crime and carried this with him into the interview. So he declared this in the interview and this threw the interview panel into a bit of a quandary because hands and shoulders, heads and shoulders he was the best candidate but of course this now presents a big cultural problem for the organisation. So the knee-jerk response was, sorry, damn it, back to the drawing board. The CEO got wind of it, and he's a very visionary individual. And he decided to look into it further, pulled the panel together, and they discussed it, they talked it through. They talked about what are the fears, what are the issues, how will it play out, what are the objections. And once they talked that through, the panel and the CEO decided that they wanted to take it a step further. So they sent out a communication to the wider organisation, and they said to them, this is what we're trying to do. We invite anyone who has an objection to come and talk to us so that we can talk the issue through. What they got was a whole lot of response from a whole lot of employees. Some of it was fear, some of it was outrage, some of it was disbelief, and everything from that to complete indifference. Some of it was even support.
and they sat down with each of those individuals and they worked it through. The net result is, as you know, the person was hired and they've been a superb fit for the organisation. There isn't anyone in the organisation now who will say that that person wasn't a good cultural fit. So, I'm not advocating that you take heinous risks in your recruitment process. But, what I am saying is, think about what you mean by organisational culture. Okay? Because, what you hear most often from hiring managers is, this person isn't a good cultural fit. And what they really mean is, this person doesn't look like me, doesn't sound like me, I don't understand them, I don't know where they come from. Therefore, they're not a good cultural fit. But the cultural fit is about the individual, not about the organisation. So, confront your biases individually and resolve them, the issues collectively. So I said in the beginning that um, cultural intelligence is about understanding yourself first so that you can understand others. So we all have a tribe and a mountain and a stream or a body of water that we relate to. So I've lived in New Zealand for 17 years. I'm a citizen. I don't hold any dual passports. This is my home. I love it. I'll never leave. But if you ask me who is your tribe, the people who absolutely formed me from when I was very, very young and shaped me to the person I am, then the people I'm showing you on the screen, that's my tribe. Those are the people who had the most profound influence on me when I was growing up. And you can see that in the background there, very, very multiracial. If you had asked me what my mountain is, it's not to be found in New Zealand. It's to be found on the tip of the African continent. And if you were to say, what is your stream? My stream is in the middle of a desert and it runs red with that desert earth when it runs. Sometimes it doesn't run at all. So in closing, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you for all of the insights that have been shared today. And I'd like you just to turn to the person next to you and in 30 seconds, ask them what their tribe is, what their mountain is, and what their stream is. Thank you.